lecture, I'm going to take you through um, globalisation and its impact on education. The lecture is broken down into three parts. The first part, we will look at uh, the features of globalisation, what we actually mean by globalisation. In the second part, we'll then apply that to education and see how these developments change and changes have um, impacted the education system in the UK, both positively and negatively. And finally, we will look at the perspectives views on how education has been affected by globalisation. I'll then take you through a 10 marker with item so you can see how this would translate into that sort of question. At the end of this lecture, it's suggested that you, you go to your independent study booklet um, which is, and complete this section of that booklet, which is in part one, section E. So for that, you would need to check your notes against the knowledge grid questions to make sure that your notes are um, complete. There is the knowledge check, the 10 quick question knowledge check, followed by a consolidation and exam style questions. OK, so let's get started then. So first of all, we need to look at what we mean by globalisation. So globalisation, the, the definition of globalisation is the process of increasing interconnectedness between people and nation states. It, it's the world becoming smaller, if you like. Um, and it has been an ongoing process for many, many years, uh, centuries, in fact. But um, we've seen a kind of explosion in globalisation in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and there are five main features to globalisation, five developments and changes that have occurred that have allowed for this greater interconnectedness and this greater, this, this smaller world that we now live in. The first and probably one of the, the more prominent types is the technological developments that we are seeing. Things like the new technology such as the Internet, um, which has created what is considered a time space compression. Now, the Internet is a relatively new invention. It's less than 25 years old and in terms of its commercial use. And it even in that 25 years it has developed massively from hardline connections where if you were using your internet at home you couldn't use your phone line um, to wi-fi to smart devices 4g and, and soon to be 5g um, data accessibility smart watches all of these things have been have exploded in the last 20 year 20 25 years which has created this smaller world, this time space compression. Whereas pre-internet times, it could take a week for a letter to get from one side of the world to the other. It's now instantaneous. Whereas before um, calling somebody, telephoning somebody uh, who was in another country could be really expensive. Now we have FaceTime, we have um, video chat and even in more recent times, we, we've seen this kind of developing further with um, multiple video chats, simultaneous video chats, such as Zoom and um, Teams and, and things like that. But these developments, these technological developments have made it easier for people to connect, to share information, to share cultures, to share ideas. Next, we have um, the economic changes that have occurred due to globalisation. So economic activity now takes place on a global scale in a 24 hour, seven day a week system. Whereas previously you would have to do your banking during banking hours, nine to five during the day. And if you put money into your account after a certain point of the day, usually about 3 p.m., it wouldn't be processed until the next day. Now you can transfer money 24 seven. You can move money between accounts. You can send people 
money if you wish electronically and you can do it two three in the morning if you really wanted to because there's nothing stopping you you are in control of that through linking back to technological developments through the internet shopping no longer takes place during business hours and you you can be online shopping at any point of the day or night usually middle of the night purchases it can be a little bit dodgy or suspect but um you can do that and that money is instantaneously taken from your account you don't have to think three days down the line oh have they taken money for that purchase if your money is not in your account you can't buy it um but also we've, we've seen this growth of transnational companies and an electronic economy so companies like amazon which are transnational they have headquarters in multiple nations around the world they employ hundreds of thousands of people but they have they they operate in an electronic economy they are able to see what is happening in each of these countries in which they they work instantaneously they don't have to wait for somebody to wake up the next morning to give them that information it's available to them you also have the growth of international banking with people having accounts in different countries around the world i'm i'm talking some t in some cases things like cayman island bank accounts where you need hundreds of thousands of pounds to open up a bank account in those countries and they're extremely secure and they're also tax havens but also you can have companies registered in countries in which they do not operate in order to benefit from tax breaks for example jacob reese mogg the mp has a, his company is registered in guernsey which is a tax haven meaning he doesn't pay corporation tax here in the uk so these economic changes are linked to those development the, those technological developments they're not these changes are not um stand alone they are massively interlinked and that leads us on to political changes and this idea which is put forward by let me see where's my pen gone yeah i may who talks about this idea of a borderless world we globalization and this growing interconnectedness has undermined the power of the nation states the people don't necessarily see them see the power of their government because the government is linked to the global and the international community governments need to think about how policies will play on an international stage they have to think about their relationships with other countries and how that could influence impact and influence various areas of their own nation but in some cases we can also see how transnational corporations have more power than governments again we can use the example of amazon who in the uk they haven't paid their corporation tax in i don't know how long but the government is not going to come after them for it for those billions of pounds that they owe because they know full well that amazon could easily take their company out of the uk causing a huge spike in unemployment and the knock-on effect would be catastrophic so these political changes this now borderless world in which we live means that the government national governments could be considered to be losing power to more transnational corporations but it could also be seen as linking into our next um feature which is cultural changes and and cultural developments this borderless world in which we now live means that cultures are able to be shared they're able to be experienced in different parts of the world to where they originated you just have to look at foods that are available now when it comes to having takeout in the evenings you have a world of options you can have chinese you can have japanese you can have fusion food pizza italian um thai 
whatever's available in your area. Um, but you can also see that in terms of the films and the music that we are experiencing and exposed to. The, there's more, more access to foreign language films through programs like uh, or processes like Amazon Prime, through Netflix, um, through other streaming services. You don't have to go to an art house cinema to watch a foreign film. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. Um, fashion has been influenced by multiple different cultures. Um, and there is a fine line between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. But these, this bleeding of cultures this, and this hybridization of cultures has had a huge, has created this sense of a smaller world. And it's argued by some that there, this has also led to the development of a global culture, the sharing of certain features of our cultures across the world. For example, McDonald's have a branch in pretty much every country in the world now. Um, you can go anywhere in the world and find a McDonald's, should you so wish. And this is linked to our final feature of globalization and that's migration. Migration has increased massively over the last 10-15 years and we're not talking here about um, asylum seekers or uh, refugees which are a, a slightly different issue. What we're talking about here is economic migrants, emigrants and immigrants who are moving to different parts of the world for economic reasons, for um, social security reasons, for better, a better life um, and technological developments such as aeroplanes make that much easier now. Um, transporting your worldly goods from one place to another isn't as difficult as it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, and this migration has helped push the cultural developments and push um, the this global type culture that we're seeing developing. So when we're talking about globalization, we are talking about how the world is becoming more integrated, more interconnected with a time space compression where things are now more instantaneous than they were previously if you're working on a global or international level. Um, and what we want to look at next is how those features, how those changes and developments have impacted and influenced education in the UK. So moving on to our second part of the lecture, when we talk about globalization and education, it has had a variable impact. Some would argue that the impact is good. Some would argue that perhaps the impact isn't as good. Um, one of the first ways that we've seen the impact of globalization on education is the increased competition for jobs. The, the, the global job market has become highly competitive with all companies now realizing that they don't have to limit themselves to the pool of candidates that are in their local area. They can cast a wider net because technological developments and migration means you can really get the best person for the job uh, rather than the best person in your area. And that has impacted schools because it means that schools have had to change curriculum. They've had to change um, the skills that they're trying to develop in their students in order to ensure that they can compete on an international level. For example, the development and the introduction of computer science into the curriculum. This is a newish, newish subject. Um, it wasn't one that I was taught when I was at school in the 90s. Um, to be fair, the internet wasn't really that prominent and computing wasn't that big of a deal at the time. But now it is, it is overtaken information technology as a subject because people need coders. And if we want to compete on an international level, 
we need to include coding as an opportunity within our curriculum. Next, um, we're seeing a lot more of the global um, computing companies such as Apple and Google um, creating content for education. They're creating resources and curriculums and they're pushing that not necessarily I wouldn't say pushing their way into the education system but they are becoming more active within the education system for example schools now tend to either be a Google school where they use Google Classroom um, and Google um, online services to support their curriculum they could be a Microsoft school or 365 school where they use Teams or OneDrive as part of their um, resource development. Or you've got Apple schools as well, where they use um, the iOS as their, as their main format. But it's the moving of curriculum online. And this has particularly been prominent in the last year with the pandemic and, remote, and the, the, the growth of remote learning, hence why I'm doing this video, um, because these companies have seen an opportunity to create a new market within the education system. These, these companies are not providing these services for free. Schools have to buy them. So schools will buy either 365, Apple or Google. And that will form the basis of their internet infrastructure, the, the technological infrastructure within schools. Um, and these companies will create resources and create programs which will attract schools and educational establishments to them. So things like with Teams, they've developed um, the Insights app where we can see who is engaging and when they've engaged and what they've engaged in. Um, with Google Classroom, you can see when people have access certain files and, and things like that. Um, you've got Oak National, which is a, an online classroom, essentially, an online school where they're providing lessons electronically and remotely from schools. So these global companies are edging their way into how schools are teaching not just what they're teaching but how they're teaching we've also seen an increase in the call for multiculturalism and the decolonization of the curriculum with the student body becoming more and more diverse there is a call for the curriculum to reflect that and to not be ethnocentric um, so not just reflecting British, white British history, but looking at, say, for example, the, the British colonies uh, and the British Empire, not just from how wonderful, what we brilliant, we colonised the world and the nun, sun never set on the British Empire um, kind of view to a more of a kind of, well, why did we colonise these countries? What impact did our colonisation have on the native um, and indigenous peoples. Um, was it such a good thing that we decided that the sun should never set on the British Empire? But, and also looking, but not all just in terms of what we're teaching, but also how we're teaching. And the people and the um, sources that we expose students to, making sure that we have a good representation of different ethnicities, genders, sexualities, voices. Um, and that's because this has been influenced by globalization and you can link it back to that cultural global development of culture of globalization where students are able to access more information. They're, they're, they are exposed to more cultures outside of the education setting and when they're not seeing that reflected in their education that's they see that as exclusionary 
it, and and that's not what we what is wanted for an education we want to see an inclusive education so we see we particularly in the last couple of years we're seeing this de colonization of curriculum and the move to a more multicultural um, curriculum we've also seen an increase in competition between schools and universities for students so um, we know that nationally there is, we have league tables we have um, Ofsted reports and things like that which all kind of in, influence whether or not somebody is sent to a particular school or not now when it comes to if we're looking at sort of like secondary schools and um, primary schools and things like that schools will use multiple different methods to evaluate their how good they are as a school and they may need to um, attract international students now this is particularly the case with schools such as Wyndham College which is a, a boarding school where although we're a state school we still need to in, in, um, encourage international students to attend here and to parents are more likely to send their children here if they can see that we are a good school because there are other international boarding schools available that they could send their children to now this is more prominent when it comes to universities universities are more have to be more competitive for their international students now that's partly because international students bring in more money their fees are higher but also if they can promote themselves as an international university you're more likely to attract students Okay. And this kind of links in with this idea of global rankings and um, global inter education systems. So um, countries are not, it's not just in schools competing against schools, it's countries competing against countries. And the standard um, system used to rank education systems is the PISA system. And you've probably heard of the PISA tests and this is an international um, program assessment program that's organized by the uh, organization of economic cooperation and development and member states and non-member states can use this system to evaluate their education system compared to other education systems in the world it's what happens is 15 year old school um, pupils are measured on maths science and reading now a selection in not every student takes the test um, schools are invited to take part and they can say yes they can say no it's up to them um, and they require a certain number of students to take part to be included in the PISA rankings so and what they do is they see whether or not the education system is getting better or not um, and what schools do is they then use the, or the what the government does sorry um, is use this information to kind of go well we're not getting better our education system is not improving or we're not as good as this other country and things like that and what schools uh, education uh, departments will do the, the government departments will do is look at the high achieving countries see what they're doing and see if there's anything that they can then bring into their own education policy to improve the education system of their nation now this sounds like a great idea because look at looking at what other people are doing and seeing what's working well for them is great however what's often forgotten when they kind of go well the scandinavian countries which are usually quite high are doing this thing and the Singapore and um, Chinese schools and the Asian schools are doing this thing and they're high achieving schools. What can we bring to the UK? What's forgotten is that in the UK, we have a different culture regarding education to these other countries. In Asian countries, education is highly valued. 
it's well funded it's well resourced and the general populace view of education is that it is extremely important and the same in scandinavian countries they have very very high budgets for um schools they have very little in terms of um accountability um for schools individual schools and, and teachers but again their culture is one of we will pay more tax to have a better education system we trust the professionals to do their job whereas in the uk we have a high accountability system we have and and this was very prominent um in the last 12 months or so um a very negative kind of media presentation of the education system and teachers with te uh, and teachers being called lazy and having an extended holiday during the the pandemic um and if schools don't open it's teachers faults if schools close it's teachers faults and all of these kind of any anything that schools do it's wrong um so bringing in those systems from asian systems and from the scandinavian systems won't necessarily translate to the culture that we have here in the uk and finally globalization has led to an increase in risk and safeguarding issues for schools so with technological developments we now need to think about e-safety and cyber security and cyber bullying we need to think about radicalization of vulnerable students in both in terms of religious radicalization in terms of the um extremist viewpoints such as extreme animal rights or um, political groups it's not just about religious groups um, we need to think about exposure to inappropriate images and inappropriate content on the internet uh, and the the something that was never even considered when i was at school in the 90s was talking about not meeting people you talk to online because you didn't pe speak to people online um we didn't have lessons on um being safe online so e-safety and digital citizenship and that sense of keeping yourself and keeping your students safe is a very relatively new development caused by those technological developments and those cultural developments that we're seeing on um, due to globalization and, for, and a good example here is the fact that schools now have to um, take into account the prevent policy and you've probably heard that word before um, and prevent is anti-radicalization it's about supporting vulnerable students um, in their lives to, to ensure that they're not becoming radicalized that they're not being used for radical um, views um, and it's a kind of counter-terrorism strategy but at the same time it is also a safeguarding strategy and part of a, the school's role has expanded beyond just keeping you safe while you're in school but keeping you safe outside of school as well through your online interactions so what do various perspectives consider about the impact of globalization on education i mean looking at those impacts that we've just looked at some of those we could say are good things the decolonization of the curriculum the increased in use of technology in school they, they can be positive things but they can also have a negative impact for example the um anti uh, the, the increased risks and safeguarding issues that have become apparent so the first view that we're going to look at is what's called the hyper hyper globalist view and this comes from ome and 
Omay argues that globalization has had a positive impact on the education system. It's created, it's helped to create students um, becoming, no, start that one again. It's helped students to become global citizens, to think outside of the bubble of their, their school, their town, their nation, and think on a more global scale. He also argues that it's created opportunities for greater respect of different views, religions, different and different general differences that we see around the world. Now, Ome uses the term tolerance as well, and I'm not a big fan of using that in this respect, but I think it has created that greater respect that you can kind of go, that's how you want to live your life, that and it's within the law great, you do you, I'm going to do me. Rather than saying, you're wrong, I'm right, we're kind of going, okay, I get where you're coming from, you do you, I'll do me, kind of thing. And finally, he argues that um, globalisation has created greater access to information for students, and that has created higher educational achievement. And it's one of the arguments that's brought up every year around exam time where it's suddenly like, oh, exams are getting easier. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's more a case of students have more access to information. They have more opportunities for study, which means that they're, they're able to achieve higher level grades. Now, does that mean we need uh, exam reform? Probably, but it doesn't mean that exams are getting easier. It just means that you have greater opportunities for study and information gathering. Next we've got our lovely Marxists who, as you can imagine, don't think globalisation has had a positive impact on education. So our key thinker here is Joel Spring and he argues that globalisation hasn't created greater equality of education, it's actually widened the gap between the privileged and the um, disprivileged. Um, he argues that um, it's created, the te technological developments have created a huge digital divide between those who can afford the technologies and those that can't. And this is something that has come up quite a lot recently with remote learning and with the um, lockdowns during the pandemic, because one of the arguments against closing schools was that not all students would be able to access online learning. Not every there may be families where they have one laptop between four children or two or three children who are all in different year groups, all doing different lessons. People may not have access to to the internet, to data, to be able to access the remote learning. Um, and those who don't have that access are then disadvantaged in terms of their educational achievement compared to those who do have that access. He also argues that it means that global corporations are setting the educational agenda. And you can kind of see that with Google and Office 365 and Apple who are creating these um, systems for, for, for schools, for, um, for study, that means that they're kind of saying, well, you need to do it this way, and you, or you need to do it that way. And there are, in fact, in, since the pandemic, there have been um, people who have in, tried to cash in by stating, so like, I'll teach you how to do the best online lessons you possibly can. I will show you how to do this, or do that, or do the other. Um, and fair play to them. We're in a capitalist economy, so make the most of it. But it allow it changes the agenda. It changes what it is that schools are trying to do and trying to achieve. And finally, Joel argues that um, the globalization has led to the disempowering of teachers. Now, this is something that came up quite recently. It was a, a tweet that I saw um, that somebody quoted where it said that um, teachers should be arguing for schools to remain open during the pandemic because otherwise they could be out of a job. If, when, if students aren't in school, they don't need teachers, they've got Google or they've got the internet. 
Now, whether or not you agree that with the rise of the internet and the access to information, teachers are becoming redundant or not, that's up to you. Um, but we can kind of see that, particularly with from the Marxist view, that globalization isn't creating um, a better education system, it's creating a more unequal education system. And that unequal education system means that the poor stay poor, the rich stay rich, capitalism ensues, and the current system stays in place. Okay. We think of the neoliberal view, and these um, say states that um, globalization means that um, governments can pay a reduced role in the education system. And because they're playing a reduced role, and this links into the idea of global transnational companies coming in and taking on education um, systems, it means that they can reduce funding. Oh, you don't need as much money because you can do it online. You, so you don't need buildings, you can do it online. Th that sort of situation, when in fact, it could be argued as a counter to the neoliberal view that in fact globalization has meant there needs to be an increase in funding because of the increased risks, the digital divide. Um, the neoliberal view also argues that um, it's allowing the expansion of private schools and universities to other countries around the world. So, for example, um, there are universities who have campuses, so they may say, I'm making this up now, but University of Boston in the United States, for example, may have a campus in Sri Lanka or in um, Canada. OK, so because and that, that although they're affiliate sites, you're still getting your um, degree from the University of Boston. Um, Harvard University, Cambridge, Oxford, um, Yale all now offer online courses where you are able to um, get a degree from those universities without ever having set on campus. OK, and our final view is the new Fordist view. And this um, view argues that um, because globalization has created this increase in competition in the job market and it has, means that governments need to increase education spending. They believe that globalization has identified more of a need for um, global, um, more need for funding for education so that we can compete on a global scale. As I was saying earlier, they're, they're arguing that um, we need to be more like the Scandinavian schools in the UK or we need to be more like the Asian schools. But the new Fordist is saying, yeah, OK, fine, but you need to match their funding because otherwise you can't compete on a global scale. OK, so. OK, so let's have a look at the exam style question. For this one, we're going to look at a 10 marker with item. So this is one where you will get about 12 minutes to answer. So the key things to remember with this question is that you need to have two clear and distinct points that must be different from each other. If the points are too similar, the examiner could see them as the same one and therefore not give you the marks that you need. Secondly, you must use the item explicitly in your answer. I will be looking for terms such as the item says, the item indicates, the item suggests, all of which will show me that you have taken information from the item. The, when you're using the item, it must come from two different points. You can't use the same part of the item twice. This shows that you're fully analysing the item. And as ever, don't evaluate, don't include an introduction and conclusion. They're not necessary in this question. 
you won't get any credit for them. You won't be marked down for including them, but you won't get any credit for including them. So it's best just not to include them at all. So how do we answer this question? So the, the first thing you need to remember to do with this question is identify your possible points. Ignore the item if you were just given what, uh, what are two impacts of globalisation on the education system? What possible answers could you give? Once you have a range of answers and you would be looking for trying to get three or four different answers, then look at the item and look and see where your hooks are. How can you apply uh, the item to the points that you have raised? There's no point looking at the item first. It's not a comprehension exercise. The item is not going to give you the answers. So you need to think about what are the points I could make? How could the item help me make this point? And then bring it together and explain how this impact, this point impacts the education system in the UK. So let's see. The part, when we're looking at possible impacts of globalisation on um, the education system, we could talk about multiculturalism. We could talk about um, technology. And that could include things like um, global companies, as well as the digital divide. We could talk about um, global rankings. Ooh. Competition. And um, and that can be for jobs or between schools. So we've, we've got a lot, quite a few points that we could make. So our next step is then to look at the item and see how we could use the item to link to this. So we've got, if we're looking at the idea of multiculturalism. Oh, that's not showing up very well. Let's try this one. Yep. Um, so where it, um, So changes has caused changes in politics, culture and the uh, economics. We've got late leading to greater multiculturalism. If we're talking about um, the digital divide, um, we can talk about use this part here. The Marxists only see it as benefiting the wealthy. Um, So we've got two points there that we can make. So let's move on to how we can make that point. So first of all, you can see here that um, I've used the item straight away. You don't have to do that. You use the item where it fits naturally within the paragraph. It just has to be used. And you can see here, I have very clearly stated I am using the item. So and I haven't quoted I've paraphrased, so it flows better within the paragraph. I've then made that into a clear point that answers the question. So globalisation has impacted the education system because it's moving away from the ethnocentric curriculum. Now, you could use the term decolonisation of the curriculum here as well. Um, but either way, it's about how schools are becoming more multicultural in their curriculum. And then I've explained why, the, how, why and how this has impacted the national curriculum, it's talking about how it's often criticised for being very white, British and middle class in nature. And the, our, um, the fact that we are being exposed to different cultures, different ideas and seeing um, different uh, ethnicities in the classroom have called for greater um, multiculturalism within the curriculum. And I've given an example here about how we look at how the authors we study in English and how we approach history, the study of history. 
And finally, linking back to the question to show the examiner I am answering the question set. Now, 10 markers with items are very straightforward, but it is about you being able to um, analyse, interpret and infer from the item rather than directly quote or looking for comprehension within the item. So what do what do now? Now that we've gone through the lecture, your task. First of all, I want you to go to the um, ISB, and as I said, it is Education Part 1, Section E, or you can use your, the remote learning plans that are available both on Teams or on the um, website, and use the notes, the, the check grid, the notes grid, to check your notes, to make sure that you are able to answer all of those questions. And if you've got any gaps in your notes or any gaps in your knowledge, it's an opportunity for you to find them and fill them. Um, if you have any questions, do message me or let me know and I will help you. When you've done that, you've got your consolidation activity and the knowledge questions. Now with the knowledge questions, I want to see two clear colors. I want to see one where you've tried to do the questions without your notes to see what you remember and then where you've gone back to correct your answers or fill in the answers with your notes. They're not being marked out of 10 or anything like that. You just need to show me that you what you know and what you don't know. And the areas that you don't know, they're the areas that you need to go back over and have a look at. And then you have your ESQs. You are only planning your ESQs. So for the um, four and six markers, just identifying possible points you could make. For the 10 marker, analysing it, um, planning it out using the planning sheet and please and writing the first paragraph. And then for the essay question, you need to write the plan, the, um, either the chain of reasoning or the filter sheet, and then your introduction and first paragraph. As I say, any questions, anything you're not sure on, message me, come see me and I will help you.